Hello there, I'm Matt Kazam, and welcome to The Humor Scientist, where each month we will dive into the ocean of funny. And not just funny for funny's sake or entertainment, but what I know will be a journey into the science of humor and how we're all hardwired as human beings. So we can all tap this powerful communication, connection, and coping tool, especially now. Humor lives inside of all of us. It's one of the two forms of communication we were given at birth. Our ability to see and experience joy, communicate happiness, and create a landscape of safety and trust. And in this flagship episode, I'd like to change the mindset when it comes to humor and help public health, medical professionals, and literally everyone around the world tap this powerful communication, connection, and coping tool that will improve wellness, mental health, and raise emotional intelligence. And that's just for starters. It also just makes people feel happy, connected, valued, and gives them a powerful sense of belonging. Now, I know this sounds all warm and fuzzy, and you know why? Because it is. Humor lives in the warm and fuzzy department of our psyches, right between our fear for intimacy and every memory of every kitten video we've ever seen ever, and some we haven't seen yet, like this one. In the end, humor makes us our most human. So it should feel warm and fuzzy. It stimulates all those wonderful and special memories, like when Uncle Arnold split his pants at the family picnic. Humor is our gateway to the subconscious and a super highway to forging a real human connection, even if it's only with yourself. And all the research and studies do show that humor does increase our resilience, giving us perspective and the ability to control and dictate our emotional future. And right now with everything humanity is going through, we're going to have to find a way, a more human way to communicate, connect, cope. So hopefully by now it's becoming pretty clear that regardless of the application or your place in the public health equation, humor is a powerful resource and worthy of this journey and quest into the how where each month we'll take a look at the many ways humor is being used and the overwhelming data, and yes, the science behind it. So excited about this project, Matt, Um, because when you think about like the past year, it really revealed a lot of disconnects that are happening in the United States and have been happening for hundreds of years. I mean, first off, let's just talk about COVID. Um, which in and itself, you know, which, where do you start? Where do you begin? Because COVID really revealed a lot of inequities around health in the United States. So basically what we're dealing with in the past year is just a year of trauma and it's a collective trauma and one that really um, highlighted and shed light on a fracturing of the United States that has always really been there and has been a fracturing that we could ignore. So it's um, not a good mix when you start um, talking about what happened around racial injustice that came up this past year. The death of George Floyd really was one of those sort of catalyzing moments that you think of in health communications. Because when you talk about racial injustice, it's such a nebulous idea, especially for people who don't experience racial injustice in their everyday lives. And of course, I'm talking about white folks. But when someone like George Floyd is killed on camera, they're very much an exemplar, right? They're someone that you can identify with. They they have a story that resonates with your own because George Floyd was not a nebulous idea. He was a person. He was a father. He was a brother. He was a son. He was someone's friend and he was someone's lover. And his death was very personal. And it was also something that could be seen. It, you know, and like what happened with Rodney King, you know, today, um, that, could, that image could be shared over and over and over again through social networks. We're much more connected in a different way and um, really brought to home that there was an inequity that was happening and that resonated across not only, you know, your pocketbook or um, in, you know, your your everyday life, whether or not you could get a certain type of job. 
It was about your safety as a person. It really spoke to what we call in public health, the social determinants of health. So George Floyd, he was a person who um, probably had asthma. He lived in an area where he didn't have access to regular health care. He had a long time struggle with substance use, with very limited access to really good care to get that addressed. He had um, engagements with legal, um, the legal complex, if you will, in the past. And so it was kind of a, you know, those are types of things that happen when you are from the Black community, more likely than from the white community. And there he was um, being crushed on camera and um, everyone could see it and it could not be denied. So, um, and folks, you know, because of COVID, they had no choice except to listen and hear it. Um, so when you talk about your question about humor, like how can humor help? Um, what you really bring home, um, Matt, is when you talk about humor, it's not a matter of yucks and jokes and rubber chickens. It's really about that engagement with each other. And it's a language that folks can use in order to start healing or start talking about things that are really, really challenging and difficult. I, and I couldn't agree more, you know, we have a lot to unpack. A lot has been done to us and it needs to come out, you know, and humor, it's just a way, as you say, you know, to connect us together so that we can have these deeper and more meaningful conversations, you know, so that we can gain someone's trust, we can show empathy, you know, and uh, so, you know, it, 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 from on and off the stage in my real life, I, I know it to be true. And, and, uh, and that's why I love this show to, to, to shine a light on that, uh, you know, it makes us feel safe and, and makes us feel almost human. And, and right now, I think we have to reset back to human and humor can do that. Yes. And, um, you know, the other thing about humor, in, especially when you talk about um, it really not only creates that language, it's sort of human emotional language. It also creates that way of breaking down barriers between people, because there's a there's a theorist named Michelle Green, and she talks about this thing called transportation. And when you engage with a story or with something around entertainment that has health information embedded in it, um, it breaks down your barriers to um, behavior change. You more likely, you're more likely to hear the message and you're more likely to engage in it and you're more likely to buy it, if you will, sure. and, um, and align with it than if you were just getting like a health pamphlet in the mail. Yeah. So it's, um, it's a way about like creating connection and humanity. And I love the idea that you talk about resetting the human because in many ways, I feel like over this past year, um, you know, we really need that. We really need that. Absolutely. And, you know, from a communication standpoint in the public health space, I say at the end of the day, you're talking about people's health. You might as well be, you know, telling them how to raise their kids and spend their money. You know, the defenses go up, you know, so, uh, you know, you're going to have to make a connection so that they would hear you. But from a memorable standpoint, the data I hear is people only remember 10 to 20 percent of anything that they they hear in a lecture or, or see in the video. Or, but if you embed the message with humor, it goes up to 50 or 60 percent. You know, and that's super important. And uh, and we're going to cover that in all the future episodes. I mean, this one really was laying the foundation and opening up the door on this journey. Um, mm -hmm. And I wanted the first guest to kind of just be the epitome, the total, you know, display of all three parts of it, the communication, the coping and connection. Mm -hmm. And I thought if I was going on a spiritual journey, I go see the Dalai Lama. But if I'm going on a humor journey, why not go talk to Patch Adams? I'm so excited about our first guest. As I mentioned, there is no one else I wanted to have on this first episode of The Humor Scientist than this amazing human right here. He is best known for his work as a medical doctor and a clown, which I know is very important to him, but he's also a social activist who has devoted over 50 years of his life to changing America's healthcare system. 
He believes that laughter, joy, and creativity are an integral part of the healing process. And with the help of friends, he founded the Gazutite Institute in 1971 in order to address all the problems of healthcare in one model. He's a doctor, but of all, above all else, he considers himself a clown first, but is also an activist for peace, justice, and care for all people. He continues his work even today. And this year he was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. In my opinion, he's not only a national treasure, but a global treasure as he has inspired and helped people all over the world, including me. Please welcome to the humor scientist, Dr. Hunter Patch Adams. Howdy folks. Hello Patch, how are you doing today? It's the best day of my life. I, I absolutely love that. and. I'll be 76 this month, and for 57 years, I've been the person I decided to make. Happy, funny, loving, cooperative, creative, and thoughtful. Is that a strategic thing to do, or is it just everything that comes out of your mouth is going to try to be funny and try to be, you know, uh, the, you know a use of humor uh, for good and, and, and all the positive effects that come along with it? Well, I became an activist at 18. And, and those six qualities I mentioned that I became were all major instruments for that purpose. So I, I want to have fun with life. And so I have fun. Yeah. It's really easy. I mean, if, if you're a beginner, get a pair of tidy whities and wear it on your head for a month. And people will laugh at you. They absolutely will. They absolutely will. And, and, and really humor to me, it, it is the ultimate health hack, but also it's a superpower. You know, I was a nerd. I was a very smart kid. I, I didn't have to do a lot of studying. I did study, but I didn't necessarily study what was supposed to be studied. And I am what could be called an extreme extrovert. So I like to engage people and humor is a very strong connector to people. Yes. But if you make people laugh, there's a good chance they'll want to talk with you and play with you and feel safe with you. Yes. And, and trust as, you. As you repeated that I say that there's not a public school in the world that teaches one hour of loving, I'm not sure there's one that teaches one hour of joy no. or one hour of humor. The teacher may be funny or there might be funny comments in the classroom, but I don't know of any that teach it as a course. You know, humor speaks to our security issues. So when it's done really well, we feel emotionally safe. We feel trusting that they say nowadays it takes 17 interactions to gain someone's trust or you can make them laugh once. How beautiful is that? But it's gotta be the right kind of humor, you know, the, the humor that brings us together and the humor that, that, that someone like Patch Adams knows all too well. I grew up in the military and I have a great empathy for military people and, and their psychologies and what they're trained to do. And when I heard that six, thousand vets were killing themselves every year. I said, I want to take them on clown trips because clown trips is teaching them about loving and fun and joy. And so I raised the funds and we took a, a group of 15 to 20 veterans with about the same number of clowns and we took them to Guatemala for one week of clowning and it stopped their suffering. And years later, their suffering has stopped from what I understand. A lot of suicidal or veteran people are not dressed funny. And so they are suddenly being laughed at for looking funny. And I think that was a real bonus. We, f we filmed that first trip and then we raised funds to take another 10 suicidal vets. And I wrote to vet organization and said, give me your most suicidal. 
and we took 10 of them to Guatemala for a week and it stopped their suffering. You know, what I tell people is I make me, I make me those six qualities and that I think anyone can make themselves. And if they don't make themselves, the society is more than happy to make them a robot. Make them buy the things that television tells them to buy and think the things that television tells them to think. Of that, and I thank you so much for the time. Now, just tell, you know, the, the hundreds of thousands of people who are going to be watching this, how can we support the Gazootide Institute, the work you're doing? Our website, and our website will tell them when we're doing something, either yeah. the classes in West Virginia, or here, or our clown trips. And uh, yes, please, if you like the idea of medicine being a gift to its people, then donate to us. We are building, we own the land, we owe no money, and we are building a 40 bed rural primary care hospital and it won't matter where you come from, it'll be in West Virginia, the poorest state, and it will serve West Virginians and it'll serve those who show up. Thank you so much. The, the world is so much better off with having you in it. Welcome inside the Humor Lab. Where we're going to dive deeper into the data, research, and science surrounding this month's topic because I want to change that mindset from humor, the entertainment, art form, Hollywood, you know, reserved for special occasions, you know, on Saturday nights, to really, you know, getting you to understand its important tool in the humanity toolbox that it is there for the bad times, to get us through the bad times, to make the great times better. But it should be something that you're looking to with strategy and intention. And the second thing I wanted to do was, in order to do that, I have to reconnect us all with the funny that lives inside of us, to really take ownership of that and, and be able to know that, that it's waiting for you at any time you want. And yes, we do call it a funny bone, but it's really a funny muscle. So, you know, it's going to take a little bit of time to really get comfortable doing it, but hopefully we're unlocking and opening the door to that process. Because the saddest thing that happens in any one of my speeches, uh, talks, teachings, whatever, is I'll ask the audience, how many of you consider yourselves funny? And it's always sad to me that only a third of the hands will go up. And then I realize, I tell them that, you know what, you're all wrong. You were all born funny. Babies are hilarious. It, you know, it's one of those two forms of communication, as I mentioned, that you're given at birth. So in the data, behind it it, it, it it just you'd have to look at a child but the data behind it is that children laugh 400 times a day adults laugh three to 15 times a day you know something happens as we mature now in some of the future episodes we'll talk about joke writing and humor and non-linear thinking and i think as we get older linear thinking gets in the way and we just kind of go from a to b and 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 that's not how humor works so you know children there's a surprise element but the good news is that they that they laugh and they're happy and they're joyful and and we really want to kind of bring some of that into our adult life the sense of play wonder nature all those things but it all comes back to these three c's of humor coping communication and connection because as I mentioned before, we cannot control what happens to us. If anything, the last year has proved that. But we 100% can control how we feel about it, dictating and controlling our emotional future and the emotional future of others. Because humor will raise the emotional intelligence. You know, when I ask the audience, how many of you consider yourself funny? Only a third of the hands go up. That means the other two thirds have shut down that part of their personality and, and really think, have outsourced it to somebody in the group or Hollywood or, or don't consider humor a, a priority. But once you do, you know, it gives you the ability to look at a situation from a different point of view, because that's what how humor works in helping us raise our emotional intelligence and adding to our wellness and mental health. Because when I write a joke, 
it, I don't commit to the ending right away. I take that that premise for a journey and drag it through my subconscious, which you're going to learn when we get into joke writing. But in order to do that, I have to look at the problem, which a premise is. It's, a, it's an idea for a joke, but the problem is I have to somehow flush that out and connect the dots. But in order to do that, I have to look at it from different perspectives and really take both hemispheres of the brain and put them in into play so that I can get clarity, I can get problem solving, you know, and then in doing that, the problem itself doesn't seem so bad. But why do people laugh? Let's give a quick little lesson in here. And I think conceptually, it'll it'll get you around those barriers that, that I know are there, which is, well, what happens if I make a joke? And not that they don't laugh, but they become offended. Or I use humor for not the positive effects. And, and, and I get that. But back to my buddy over here, Mahadev. <laughs> Laughter occurs when people are comfortable with one another, when they feel open and free. And more importantly, when the laughter occurs, each laugh, more bonding occurs. So, you know, within the group, because we're at our safest when we're making each other laugh. We're at our best as humans when we're making each other laugh. The laughter really just is the physiological response to humor, as many of you know out there. It's also the release of nervous energy, which we'll touch on later on with joke writing, but this is just the physical response. But deeper what makes us laugh, we laugh basically for two reasons. And this is kind of where I see, you know, people's apprehension towards using humor is because of the superiority aspect of it. We laugh for two reasons. We laugh at superiority and we laugh at a commonality. And the superiority one does exist. I mean, it feeds our security issues. If you make fun of somebody else, it might make you feel better because you feel like your place in the food chain is a little bit higher and, and that sort of thing. But I do train people that if there is a victim in the joke and it's not you, do not tell it. You know, how we start this with intention and how we mine for the material is how we avoid the negative aspects of humor. And something I clearly want to get across today, that if you are talking about a person, superiority jokes don't work. However, if you're talking about things, you know, like, for example, cell phone, why this cell phone might be better than a flip phone. You know, there's lots of ways you can't check your email on that one. All the jokes would write themselves. But the second you start talking about the person, why a person might have a flip phone in 2021 versus, you know, an Android or iPhone, then you're really getting into personal things like, you know, it could be cognitive issues. It could be financial issues. It could be met, anything. So you want to steer away from that. So when we're talking about things, sure, superiority works. But when we're talking about people and the beauty of humor and its real power is not in how it divides us, but how it brings us together. And the last thing I want to leave you with is embrace this, your origin story. Some of the best comedy being done now is being done with my students because they don't want to be comedians. They're just regular people who have had success, failure, and just want to share their story with the world. You know, your pain your, has a purpose. Your origin story all has a purpose. You have the fuel for humor inside of all of you. And now with that, let's look at our last big takeaway. Thanks so much for tuning in today. It really does mean a lot to me. And wherever you are on the planet, I hope you're doing well, or as well as anybody can during these trying times. And that really is what this show is all about. Trying to use humor to make life easier, make it better, or at least more tolerable, regardless of the application of the situation. And the good news is, what I'm saying, we all know to be true. On a deep, intuitive level, no one refutes that humor when used properly and mined for with intention and strategy and delivered with empathy and kindness can not only change the course of your day, but might very well change the direction of our species and connect us in the most beautiful and basic of human ways. I hope you join us next time in The Humor Scientist. And remember, when the going gets tough, the tough get laughing. Be well, my friends.